Hi everyone and welcome to another Fusion 360 tutorial. In this video we're going to talk about the tool library in the manufacturer workspace. We'll touch on tips and tricks of how to manage your libraries as well as covering some of the amazing improvements we've made in the April 2021 release. As you can see we've got our part all ready to go. I've already created my setup. As you can see we're just using block stock and I've chosen to put the work offset at the top middle of the component. So with that let's jump into the tool library and take a look. And right off the bat, you'll notice a couple of differences. Firstly, we've added these row borders. That's going to help you distinguish between each tool in the list. And secondly, notice how quick it was to load. That's because we're only by default loading the document tools until you navigate and select either a local or a cloud library. This is going to make it much easier when you're selecting your tools and improve the overall speed and performance of the tool library. The next thing I want to touch on is a bit of a workflow tip. So if I go ahead and select my document tool library, you'll see that there's no tools in it yet. We haven't actually started manufacturing anything, but I do have a couple of local libraries set up for each of my available machine tools. So my advice when using the tool library is this, before you start creating any tool paths, go ahead and open the tool library and start populating your document library. So I know I'm gonna run this part on this particular machine tool. So I'm going to use shift, just to select each and every tool in this library. And this brings me to our first improvement. We've added the ability to click and drag tools between libraries. Now, one thing to note, you notice how it didn't remove any of my tools from my local library? That's because this click and drag is always copy. It will always copy from whichever library you're in to whichever library you drag to. Next improvement we've made is the ability to see the tool information. So you see on the right hand side here, we have this info panel. This is going to list all of the various different parameters associated with that tool. You see a couple of them are pinned already. This is going to give you the ability to choose your favorite parameters and make them always pinned to the top of the list. So if I'm always interested in overall length, let's go ahead and pin that. And you can see now it's applied to the top of this list. As I select a different tool, you can see these five are always pinned to the top. Now, don't worry. If you use both milling and turning tools, it's only going to pin and show you the relevant information. Now I've got one thing left to do to this tool library before I start programming, and that's to create an engraving tool. So I'm going to go ahead and press this plus icon just as before. We've actually changed the name of the chamfer mill tool to engrave slash chamfer mill. This is to improve discoverability of how to create tools for an engraving purpose. We've also changed its icon to make it look a little bit easier to identify. Let's go ahead and choose the engrave slash sample mill. Let's head over into the cutter tab and you can see we've changed the image to make it a little bit easier to understand. We've also made a few small minor changes to the way that the engraving and chamfering tool is defined. And the first one is that we've set by default this tip diameter to zero. Another thing we've added is an inclusive angle. It's a simple calculation, just times in the taper angle by two. But it does bring us in line with how the manufacturers define their tools. The only thing left to do on this tool is to select a holder, choose the holder, press select, and I'm happy with this tool definition. Another thing we've changed is you can now use the enter key to accept a dialog and the escape key to close. So if I simply press the enter key at this point, you can see it's accepted the dialog and we're back to the main tool library. If I right click on any tool, you can see we've added a variety of different keyboard shortcuts to perform a variety of different actions. Edit is enter. Copy is of course control and C on Windows. And to delete the tool is the delete key. Fairly obvious changes, but some nice improvements. So now I've got my tool library set up and it's on the document level. So now I know I can just come to this document library and choose the tools while I'm programming. And with that, we can press close and create some tool paths. So the first operation I'm going to do, so I'm actually going to rough out the material on the outside of this component. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and use a 2D adaptive clearing. From here, let's go ahead and select a tool just as we would before. And again, we've made some small improvements, but some improvements that should really help your workflow. The first one is that we now automatically select the document library. So it's easy to go ahead and choose either a tool you used before or a tool you've copied into this particular library. The next thing you'll notice is if I open the filters tab, you'll see that we're now automatically defining the tool category. And this is done based on the type of toolpath we're coming from. In this case, we're coming from a 2D milling toolpath. And therefore the tool category is B 
been pre-selected as milling. So if I came from any of the 2D or the 3D milling operations, it's going to pre-populate the milling tool category. If I enter in from a drilling operation, it's going to predetermine a whole making category. I'm free to change this. So if I actually wanted to use a milling tool for a hole making operation, I can just go ahead and change that tool category. We've also improved the dimension filters. So if I go ahead and open up diameter, you'll see now it automatically defaults to equal. So if I know the diameter I'm looking for, I can really easily enter that diameter, select my tool and go ahead and press select. Now let's pretend I've chosen the wrong tool. So to change it, of course, I'd press select again. And here's another change. If I now navigate back to filters, you'll see we're still applying this milling tool category, but we're also still applying this diameter. We're persisting the filter in choices. The next thing you'll notice is it's automatically selected the tool that you chose before. This is gonna allow you to find it much easier, especially when you've got lots of tools in your tool library. So again, I'm happy with this tool, so I'll go ahead and press select. Next, we'll quickly choose our geometry. In this case, this particular contour here and go ahead and press OK. Now I'm going to use a derived operation on the right click menu to create the finishing pass around the outside of the part. At this point, we can now start creating the feature that runs around the outside of the component. And we're going to do that by creating a form tool. So to do that, I'm just going to open up my models node and turn on the sketch that represents my form tool. And to create a form tool, what you're going to want is a closed sketch that's going to be automatically revolved by the form tool dialog. So let's open up the manage dropdown and enter into the form mill dialog. The so first thing I need to do is select the tool profile. The next thing I need to do is select the tool axis. The red arrow is going to represent the positive Z direction of the tool. So if you need to flip it, you can do. In this case, we don't. And the last thing I need to do is select a compensation point. Now the compensation point is going to be the point in which this tool is used to cut any selected contours. So in this case, from a compensation point, I'm going to go ahead and choose this point here. And with that, I can press OK. Well, what you see is nothing will really happen. But as I then navigate into my tool library and to my document library, you'll see it's created this form mill tool here. So let's go ahead and right click and edit this particular form mill, enter into the cutter tab. And what you'll see is we've added a tip offset. Now this tip offset is gonna be the distance between the bottom of the tool and effectively your compensation point, And it's measured in Z. From there, I can press accept and I'm ready to use my form mill. So let's just go ahead and hide the sketch. Get a bit of a nicer view. And we can go ahead and start programming with a 2D contour. Let's go ahead and open the tool selection dialog. Again, we've entered into our document library, which makes it really easy for me to choose the form mill and go ahead and press select. Now let's go ahead and choose our geometry, this contour here. And with that, we'll press OK. So you might have noticed that there's actually no holder definition assigned to this particular tool yet. And this brings me on to another improvement we've made. If you right click on the tool path and go to edit tool, open up the holder tab, you can now select any of your tool holders. Simply press the accept, will save the changes. Now let's go ahead and face off the top of the component. For this, I'm gonna use a simple 2D face. Go ahead and select my tool. Again, I'm in the document tool library. I'm gonna go ahead and filter it by flat end mill and I'm going to choose this 12 millimeter flat. And another improvement we've made is you see this list now at the bottom with all the cutting data. You can now see all the individual speeds, feeds, feed per tooth, lead in and lead out feed rates directly from the main tool library dialog, which just really gives you a little bit more clarity into which particular cutting data will be best for which particular job. If I go ahead and edit one of these, it's going to take me right to the cutting data tab and to that particular item in the list. Another improvement we've made is you can now actually reorder these. So let's say you work a lot in plastics. You can now drag the plastic presets right to the top of your list. And that's just gonna make it easier when you're selecting them in the future. When I edit a cutting data name, 
It's going to select all of the text. Again, it makes it much faster to rename. When I create a new one, it's going to be blank, ready for me to go ahead and type a new name. So I'm happy with the cutting data for this particular tool. So we can go ahead and accept. You see how the plastics are on the top of the list now? Much easier for me to select. Go ahead and choose that tool. Choose a boundary. Go ahead and press OK. Now remember we created that engraving tool. We haven't actually done any engraving yet. So let's go ahead and look into this text. I'm going to create a new 2D profile. I'm actually going to use engrave. You don't have to use engrave to engrave your text, but I'm going to do in this case. First thing I'll do is select a tool. Let's go ahead and choose that engrave slash chamfer mill tool we created before. Choose our geometry. In this case, I could manually select each one of these letters inside and outside, but I'm actually going to use the sketch. So let's go ahead and turn that sketch on, select the lettering and press OK. Just so you can see what's happening, let's go ahead and hide that sketch one more time. And you can see the depth of the engraving is signified by the distance between each of the contours. With that, let's go ahead and run a simulation of the toolpaths we've created so far. And let's look at them one by one. So the first toolpath we made was the roughing of the outside of the part. We then faced off the top of the component, ran a finishing pass around the outside. And at this point, we've got our form tool. So let's run through this one slightly slower. You can see that it's cutting the material around the outside. Now you might have wanted to add multiple step overs, which you can do within the 2D contour operation. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we're just cutting it in one pass. And then the last operation, we did this text. So let's have a little zoom in to the text and run through that particular toolpath. If I actually change the colorization, you'll be able to see this a little bit better. And there you can see we've nicely engraved the top of our component. So with that, that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this video on all of the tool library improvements we've made. Make sure to check out the other improvements we've made in the April 2021 release. Thanks for watching.